Uh, oh, I'm actually recording. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist episode 96. Muhammad, how's it going? Just realized my sock is inside out, so I'm adjusting that. Do you wear socks indoors? I always wear socks. I wear socks to sleep, bro. Ow. Ouch. Apparently, it's, apparently it's very weird, but I love I mean, it. I mean, I remember, yeah, I used to live in this place in London and we called it the dungeon, okay? <laughs> and in, in that place, I used to wear socks to sleep, yeah, because it was cold, cold dungeon. <laughs> yeah, bro. It's cold here, man. Right. Mm. We're, we're right next to the sea. And yeah. Um, SubhanAllah, look at that. My laptop is just booted up now. MashaAllah. So for everyone listening, Muhammad's uh, son smashed his laptop today and he just found <laughs> out when we were going to start the episode. So, so we're on plan B. <laughs> plan B, which is audio only. Yeah. Um, so we're what, 30, about 30 minutes late recording because I was trying to figure out what to do. Mm, yeah. But, but here we are. Yeah. So, you know, I found, you know, like, for example, you, yeah, in the winter in the UK, do you have heating on during the night time? Oh, Yeah. Oh really? Is that normal? Uh, I don't know. This is the first time I've lived. You know, this place where we're living now is the first time I've lived. You know, outside of my family's. Yeah. So I don't know. So what's the norm for them? For them, I, I think my mum just used to just. It didn't used to get too cold there, so my mum would just put it on when we needed it. Whilst right. here, I tend to be a bit more generous. Like I don't mind having it on mm. all the time because it gets really yeah. cold in the winter. It costs a lot, but. Mm. I felt maybe the pricing is different, different companies, different places. But from what I know, um, in the UK, it was so cheap. I found it cheap, the heating. Like it was, it's gas, isn't it? So gas is different to electricity. I think it was like £30 a month or something mm, like that. Maybe. I mind, um... Obviously, it depends on your usage, isn't it? But... It depends. In the summer, I'm hardly paying anything because I hardly use it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was surprised, to be honest. I think in the UAE, um, obviously, there's no gas, like, there's no heating, but there is uh, uh, just electricity. That is mm. very expensive. That's, uh, I want to say, definitely more expensive than the UK. Surprisingly, you know, because you would imagine they can, like, burn their fossil fuels and make energy like that. But yeah, I don't know. Is, you know, the water water makes sense because they have the they, they only get water from desalination right it's not from the ground or rain or anything yeah yeah of so, course uh, water and electricity very expensive um i'm over here in turkey of course so we've got uh in the house here we've got um you know radiators so that's something new for me new ph phenomenon whereabouts are you specifically i'm in istanbul in uh one of the kind of it's like not the Istanbul that most people would have seen because I'm like pretty much on the edge of Istanbul. Oh, okay. Um, this area where uh, there's a lot of Arabs out here. So I came here for that kind of reason. And uh, yeah, it's a very, it's like modern, bro. It's not like you're not seeing any uh, 500 year old Masajid or anything like that. Like probably, yeah. I think where I am, maybe 20 years ago is like farmland. So it's a different kind of side of it. But then, you know, uh, in about 45 minutes you can get to the all the old plays and touristic stuff and hmm. yeah it's, uh, it's nice bro I've, but i've been to turkey uh every season except winter so now i'm seeing winter and oh, i've only know, been in winter yeah um what month did you go uh, i think we went in january hmm. so i think january is the coldest but i was like uh, i'm actually you know, pleasantly surprised because I was thinking, look, I'm going now in the worst time of the year. So let me see, you know, weather wise. So let me see, you know, what it's like. And it's not that bad, bro. Like it's what time is it? It's 9.30 PM and it's still eight degrees. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and during the day, it's like, you know, 12, 13 degrees. So it's pretty good. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, How are you doing in terms of language and stuff? <laughs> yeah, man. So I actually, maybe I had a, Maybe I'm in the, because I thought I could come here and uh, this area of Istanbul, it's like, if you know Arabic, you're fine, right? But turns out it's not really true. Like um, there, there's a butcher near me who's like Syrians, they're all Syrians and they speak Arabic. So that, that's fine. That's a relief, you know, when I found yeah. them and I was like, oh yeah. But 
um, yeah, like everywhere else is just like Turkish. Like I went to get a SIM card and I was like, uh, do you speak English? And then she's just like, nope. And then she just start talking me in Turkish. They're not like into the whole accommodating for you if you don't know their language. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, I'm, I, I know words here and there. So every day, you know, if I go to the shop, I uh, <laughs> try and use a word or two, you know, like, to, <laughs> like uh, a, a funny example. Yeah. I was, I went to the shop and she said, it's uh, seven liras 20. Okay. So I understood those words, seven and 20. I was like, okay. Yeah. I know those words. Um, so I gave her uh, 10, 10 liras. And then I was like, oh, I can give you 10, uh, 20, sorry, in uh, Kurush is, you know, in change, 20 uh, cents or whatever, you know. So yeah. I, I don't know how to say that, except I know the, the, the word 20. So I just said, I'll give you, and then I said, uh, what was it, Yirmi, I'll give you Yirmi, I'll give you 20. So she kind of understood that. <laughs> yes, I just said one word in Turkish. So it I comes slowly, bro, but um, I can see myself learning it, to be honest. Uh, it's like, it's, there's a good... Um, I don't know, at least 30% Arabic words. So it really helps. Yeah. Because you, yeah. one thing that shocked me, bro, is I'm in the supermarket. I'm trying to buy stuff. And uh, it's like you don't understand how you can look at products and you don't know what's what. Like, you know, you have like different types of milk. If you don't know the language, you don't know what's low fat, what's high fat, what's this, what's that, right? Oh, yeah. So Forget about that. You're going to have to stick to the basics. <laughs> yeah. But but like, what is the bait? Like, I don't know what, which milk is which even, you know? Yeah. So, um, but that's where sometimes Arabic really helps because uh, you can work out what something is or what it means from, from the Arabic if you can try and, try and uh, convert mm. the Turkish word into Arabic. So that helps. That's like 30% or maybe a bit more. And then a uh, little bit of French as well. So maybe like 30% Arabic, 10% French. And then, you know, every language has bits of English here and there. So, yeah. you know, you're about, you're about 50% um, in, in terms of just words. But obviously, grammar is a whole other story. You need some Turkish friends on speed dial that you can call. Yeah, man. You have I mean, an issue. <laughs> some people, uh, I got a friend here who uh, he's been living here for over a year. And he he's like, he I think he lives more in an even more Arab area than me. He's like, yeah, I don't need anything but Arabic out here. I'm actually fine. Um, he's yeah. like, whenever I need Turkish, I go on Google Translate and it's got that conversation um, Oh, it just feature. uses that. Yeah. So I don't know. That might work well. Um, but yeah, bro, it's uh, it's very amazing country, to be honest. Amazing country. Mm. Good mm. country. Good people. Um, I, I see them as having, like, they got some good aspects of of like what arabs have um and then they have like where arabs fall short a little bit in terms of sometimes a bit too uh what's the word not not doing things by the book or not like following a process they're a bit more they like to be a bit more organized i think so that's good about them um Fun. yeah maybe they're a bit they're less hospitable than arabs but they're still hospitable so yeah man inshallah khair bro may yeah. Allah make it um, easy for you out there I mean yeah I mean I can't say it's hard at all uh, to be honest bro it's like you know you come out here bro you see some some prices man so cheap because you know the lira has like fallen in value like crazy yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me try and give you a good example um, I don't know uh, milk okay a litre of milk how much is that in the UK oh uh, a litre is very specific. I think we work in pints here. Let's have oh, a look. That's true. Yeah. Let's have a look. That middle sized bottle in the UK, I think that's two litres. A litre of milk in the UK. La, 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 la. The average farm gate milk <laughs> Yo, price. Mohammed, you got to search this. Yeah, You're bro. I've touch, got to. Bro. I don't really pay attention. I'm just so wealthy. You just I just the card, bro. Bro, I swipe that bad boy. I say beep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, apparently it's 30p a litre here 30p a litre okay yeah, yeah. the average yeah. well that actually bill. sounds similar to here then I was, I was trying to show how cheap it is <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently uh, so but stuff like that is always subsidised bro yeah that's true subsidised so it's not a good example okay um 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 um, um. Okay, eclairs. I got a box of eclairs. Six eclairs. Okay. 
Okay. That was like 50p. <laughs> Come on, you must have some. Oh, I don't think the last I don't think I've ever bought an eclair. Let me see. A six pack, yeah? Hmm. Six pack of eclairs on Amazon here is they sell eclairs on Amazon. Oh no, this is four hundred. No, I know what you're talking. About. What do you mean six pack? This is confusing. Six eclairs. Yeah, six eclairs. <laughs> six eclairs. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Bro, you know, like when they're trying to, like, they're, for example, I know they did this with Boris Johnson. They asked him like, how much is a pint of milk? He and he, he 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 did he didn't know right and that like they tried to show how he's not in touch with the average person and stuff. So box, uh, box of eclairs is by weight. Yeah, 420, yeah, four hundred twenty grams. Maybe not a good uh, comparison. Oh, right. We need to think of something. Well, it, maybe you need to know the price. <laughs> so oh, can... the so specific <laughs> box of okay, eclairs. Okay, what about a kilo of chicken? <laughs> ah, well, that see that varies as well because I wouldn't know because I only shop from like like uh, private butchers as opposed to like chain supermarkets yeah okay so how much is it for a kilo like uh breast chicken breast oh i don't know i buy my i buy it i buy loads of meat in bulk and i never actually check i know prices. i know how much it is bro i'll help you out here i remember in <laughs> asda in east london it was uh halal they had halal chicken there i think it was six pound a kilo that sounds like that sounds yeah. about right so over here i think it's 90p a kilo no, wait, wait, sorry, it's, it's 20 lira, so it's two pound a kilo. Yeah, I'm looking at Tesco, for example, and Tesco British chicken thighs, a kilo mm. of thighs is five pound. Yeah, so it's about that. Yeah, so um, so there we, we have something real to compare. But you only benefit off of that if you're living with external money, you know. Um, if you're being paid, you know, Turkish to money for a Turkish job. Yeah. I don't know, to be honest. It depends, I guess, on your job. I don't know. I guess the salaries are not amazing here. Maybe, yeah, maybe if you're getting paid in lira, then it'll be similar to living in um, England. Maybe. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I was just talking about for externalers. That's the life hack, bro. You make foreign money living in a foreign country. That's what you do. Yeah, it is. That's true. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Um So, yeah, man, I mean... Uh, there is a bit of a curfew and stuff over here, but it's, I think, more relaxed than UK. So if people want to come out here and have Keep a you company, have a little break, a little break, roll through. Break, break I know John leg. Fontaine's out here. Uh, oh, is, he oh yeah. And people to come over and stuff. He's in Bursa. No idea. I don't really know much about Turkey. Bursa's like the fourth biggest city it's like an hour and a half from istanbul did you get hassled at the airport when i went we got hassled quite a bit um no i didn't it was very very smooth when i came but That's when nice. i came when i came uh poor must have been uh, six years ago on my own i was i was i had a transit through here and i thought you know what let me spend a day in istanbul so uh, i actually got stopped there and they they asked me all these questions and they said they said, prove to me you're not ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think they're like very on edge because back it must have been 2000 and I don't know, six years ago. So 2014. So it was like the height of that stuff. Oh. And I'm coming through with a big beard. And I was on my own and I had a tripod right. with me. And they, they kept looking at the tripod like, what is that thing? Um, but, you know, when I come through with my wife and that now, it's like, yes, yeah, no problem. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's welcoming, I would say even. Alhamdulillah, I hope so. Maybe yeah. I should try again. Yeah, last time I went, it was a bit tense. Yeah. Well, At one that, point, I was somewhere was in Istanbul, ago, like, yeah, I was somewhere in Istanbul, like, eating dinner, bro. And I was just hearing, like, loads of, I thought it was fireworks, but it turned out it was gunshots. In Istanbul? <laughs> yeah, bro, because then when I went out, hmm. when I went out, there was, like, a big police raid around, like, the corner. Okay. And it's this property and stuff. Oh, okay. Ooh. So they were the ones firing. Either that or it's mm. back and forth, bro. But yeah, I mean, I honestly, like, oh. I think I think Istanbul, uh, especially for its size, is quite safe. Yeah. Um, but any city this size, like 15 million people, there's probably uh, gangs. There's a lot. Of oh yeah, every, yeah, of course. Yeah, all of that of going on. You know, even like you, you know, I see that side of it in the city I live in, and yeah, uh, before this job, I just would have guessed it. But mm, now I'm yeah. just seeing things that so people we all never have see. An illusion of safety. 
Oh, de- definitely. And actually, like, uh, even in the city that I'm in, I don't know, what is the population of this city? Let's see. Uh, see, because I haven't got the camera on, I can do all these funky searches without feeling guilty. So, <laughs> we've, oh, 2011. There's a, there's a statistic from 2011 of 230,000. Oh, no, it's definitely more. 2020's population is now estimated at 606,000. So even now, it's not too bad. Mm. But only like a small, small percentage of the stuff that we deal with ends up on the news. Yeah. Because yeah. I always check every day after work. I check the next day. I'll, I'll check the news and I'll be like, especially the local paper. Mm. I'll just see if anything I've done is in the news and nothing's on there. Mm. Uh, it's rarely that something makes it on there. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can make so much money selling stories to the news. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't do that. Mm. No, I don't do that. Of course not, like, yeah. Handedly. Yeah, you just sell artwork, bro. Bro, I haven't sat down on um, done any of that in a long time. I know why, bro. I know why. Why? It's your PlayStation. You know, I haven't even played that that much either. I just oh, don't have no. time anymore like I used to. Mm. So do you regret getting it? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. To be honest, it was a very big impulse buy. It was because everybody was struggling to get one that I had to get one. I don't know why. I was just like, I want to play I want to play along with this game. <laughs> but um, it's the only sort of stuff I spend money on. Other mm. than that, I can't really justify buying anything. Um, mm. I'm, a big in, I'm a big stock investor, bro. <laughs> that's yeah, it better than other stuff for sure definitely bro it's, it's just it's annoying because it's uh something that i wish we were all educated on earlier on in our lives mm. um because they never really talk about that sort of stuff at school do they they kind of i don't know they just p- put you in this sort of uh mode mm-hmm. when it comes to money and work and stuff and it's like a very normative approach to employment yeah. everything is like oh you will be employed by somebody one day and you'll do this one day and you, you know what i mean and yeah. working towards that system but there's nothing about entrepreneurship the there's nothing themselves about... don't know in it no yeah yeah that's true and um so it's like for example me yeah if i you know out of my working life very small amount of it has been in employment right yeah um am i the type that's going to go and be a teacher not really in it so... i think you were though weren't you yeah, I was, but but now that I <laughs> tasted entrepreneurship, I'm not never going to go back to being a teacher. So no. none of the kids are going to have a teacher who has that side, that uh, perspective, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I've since getting into this for what? How long has it been? Maybe a year now. Hmm. Um, it's like I'll get like some sort of money from something. Hmm. Like what was it? I had, I must have had some sort of like tax rebates or whatever recently, and I'm just like oh like first it was like oh, i could buy something with this and then i'm like oh but no and then once you've invested it you're like that's it you don't want to ever touch it ever again mm. and you can't think about spending like mm. i don't save the fact that you have savings just sitting there doing nothing is yeah. abhorrent to me i can't deal with that yeah <laughs> because yeah. It's, it's just it's like a it's almost like a what's it called a um what do they call that thing an hourglass you know, the, 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 the sand is, is the dropping, inflation. bro. Exactly, bro. It's just tr- it's just trickling in value. Mm. I mean, that's um, a good that's a good thing, that I guess, that it's given you if you see it that way. Because most definitely. people absolutely don't see it that way. I think I feel like that's the case anyway. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely. the way I do it is I would I would have a certain. I don't know if it's called an emergency fund because it's a lot more than that. But I would mm. like to have that much. Um, saved and then anything beyond that i would invest see i just the way i see it is i literally just invest it all because i can always take it out if there is an emergency but if i have it if i have it immediately accessible as an emergency then i'm more Mm. likely to use it whilst at least Mm. if it's invested there's going to be some delay in terms of um terms of getting it out like it there'll Mm. be a few days so what if it drops in value though like 20 percent, for example you lose 20 of your money 20 percent is fine because it's not a hundred percent. As long as whatever my my I'm way I'm way above what I'd consider emergency fund. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So if it drops here and there, that's fine. It's not about the drop here and there. It's about the long term. You know. And once you've got once you're over the the limit of it depends on what you're investing in, obviously. But yeah. once you're over the sort of large like for okay for some for, for some things, let's have a quick look. 
for some investments, I'm up. Yeah, like my best best performer is over a hundred percent. Yeah. So you're saying it's unlikely for that to go. So it's down unlikely to drop back that, to like, yeah, back down to. And even if it does, if it hits zero, mm. I've still got you what still, I initially invested. Yeah, you haven't lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if I start losing, then uh, you know I'm prepared to li- basically don't invest what you're not prepared to lose. The yeah. chances that you know I'm not, I haven't invested in just one thing. You know, I've, mm-hmm. I've spread everything out, diversified, etc. Mm-hmm. So you know, the chances of everything tumbling beyond, way beyond what I've initially invested, is mm-hmm. unlikely. But mm. it's just as unlikely as an emergency coming along and, you know, wiping away everything mm-hmm. that I've had to spend. For example, I don't know, my car completely finishes or my, I don't know, my house yeah. burns down or my furniture goes. Like that's, mm-hmm. these are all things that could happen. They're all tests from a last prime Yeah. Um, so I, I, as, as opposed to, you know, the money just sitting there, I'd rather it working for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you follow like the news now relating to these bigger companies yeah i do i do at least the ones i'm sort of watching i do mm. um uh, but it depends like so i've got a whatsapp group for stuff like this now and i advertise on instagram we had a lot of brothers sort of joining in mm. um i don't know how many people we've got on there now maybe about 20 or 20 or 30 let's have a look mm-hmm. uh, 21 um at the moment people leave and go in and out and stuff so everybody's different some brothers are very short term like they will have a lot of money they'll they'll do basically what they call swing trading or day trading whatever mm. they want to call it yeah. where like you know for example like a few percent on 10 10 grand is a lot yeah. you know that's that can, you can make a lot that that day and then you just take it in and out very quickly mm-hmm. it's very stressful it's very volatile i tried it and it's just a headache and it consumes you because you're just sitting there watching the graph course, yeah. you know and what inherently what you do want to do is go for the long term be patient and just basically yeah. make an investment and sort of sort of half forget about it you yeah. know maybe check in here and there but you're tr- not thinking about you know next week or next month you're thinking about like 5 10 15 years down the line mm-hmm. and you want to keep building up your positions and that and that's mm-hmm. what people do like we were listening to um power, who were we listening to a lot we used to read um Four hour work week, didn't we? And uh, I forgot his guy, the guy's name. We we'll speak about him. Jim uh, Powers. That's the one. And he made a lot of his money on like investing in Facebook and stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, similarly, with a lot of people. And it's just, it's it's almost like a, um, it's almost like it's not a secret avenue, but it's like a, an avenue that only those that pass it on to their kids and stuff will know about. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. Um, I feel like this is it is kind of common knowledge in the US anyway, where it's but the true. way they do it is different to what you're saying. Um, what they kind of recommend is you um put money into uh, an index fund, right? Yeah, which yeah, is, yeah, which is a mixture of different stocks. Um, yeah. something like uh, what's it called? The S&P 500, which is the 500 most valuable companies in the US. Yeah, yeah. You, you put, you, 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 for example, you put 10, 10K in and it will just get spread amongst those 500. And, yeah. you, and, and therefore you're very diversified. And mm. that kind of, that's like the standard way to do it. And I think it sounds like to me, that's very common in the US. And yep. that kind of thing you can expect to make like, I think 9% a year. Of course, that. the and that's the thing. Like that is that is all well and good. And thing is, we've yeah. got Islamic alternatives now. Like I know there's well head investors do similar. Yeah, they exactly. help screen stocks for you. But the thing is, with those you know mainstream funds, is that you can't guarantee. Um, it's you know, the Sharia, com- exactly. yeah, the Sharia yeah, compliance yeah. for those companies. That's the so tricky bit. I think what the the, the 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 few things that have empowered a lot of Muslims at least to sort of look into this now, especially mm. me. I'll be honest, especially me, because mm. um, is the, the the tech that is now making it accessible. Yeah. Right. So, because years ago, I I had an investment account with like Hargreaves London, I think they're called, mm. but it was so like you're not speaking to anyone, and it's all like this paperwork and it's all this other stuff and all these fees, and it kind of just intimidated me off of it. Like I just mm. I felt like I didn't know what I was doing, mm. you know. So I stopped, yeah. and then recently, you know, there's all these sort of platforms, all these mm. apps, all this everything that basically made mm. it so accessible again. Do uh, you courses, use um, Revolut to uh, trade? No, I use trading two one two. Okay. Mm. Um, 
But before I did now, any even of that, bro, even in these digital banks, you can trade from yeah. right in your banking app. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, before I did that, I went on Udemy and I looked up some courses and I started studying stuff because it's so yeah. accessible to do so. As opposed to back when I did it, mm. I didn't know about courses. I didn't have, mm. do you know what I mean? I was just shoot, like stabbing in the dark. Yeah. And now um, there's even, um, I, know, I don't know if you know what's said, Joe Bradford. Yeah, of course. Of course. There we go. Um, he's like backing this um, financial screening tool, the Sharia compliance financial screening tool called Zoya. Yeah. Yeah, we um, talked about this, bro, on another yeah. episode, yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, I, to be honest, I like what they do, and I pay for yeah. their premium sort of service. Oh, oh so you um, use them to decide if it's... Yeah, you know, I, I do. Safe. You know, I, I will use them because I've always, I've always sort of um, learned from, well, I say always, since I've known him, I've learned from him, uh, Sheikh Joe Bradford, and um, yeah, I just use it as a base sort of to, to see, okay, the Sharia compliance of it, and that's kind yeah. of where I how i go about it mm, um mm. i know i've had a lot of people asking me and i haven't really been too um, transparent but i'm just trying to be as transparent as possible now because i just feel like there's a benefit for people in it mm -hmm. um but i am not ignorant to the fact that i am part of a new wave of millions of people that have just jumped on this recently especially mm -hmm. like during covid and lockdown like i wouldn't say that i'm a veteran or anything like that no way i just i know that i'm part of this new wave mm -hmm. um and because of this new wave and this ease of use the fundamentals of investing have kind of been shaken a bit because you're getting a, a huge influx of new people that aren't really yeah. investing based on fundamentals. Young money, and, I guess they call yeah, it. Yeah, young money. And it's just all, a lot of it is hype, bro. Like a lot of, you know, stocks, some stocks are shooting through the roof based on hype of new yeah, people, yeah. not as not based not, on fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. some of the traders, um, especially those that do day trading, yeah. they like will use, um, what do they call it? Uh, basically analysis you know um, yeah yeah uh, models and analysis to predict rather than like news so there we yeah. are i don't care what the news says i'm just going to look at what the numbers tell me yeah. other people like they look at the news and i guess for people like you and i it's much easier obviously to just look at the news and yeah and you know make those assumptions now bro i want to ask you because i i kind of nearly got into this myself but then i just thought it's not the right place for my money but i was wondering with Zoya, for example, it'll tell you yep. if something is Sharia compliant or not. Have you yep. ever been in the case where, in the situation where you've bought something and it was halal at the time, and then later on it was no longer Sharia compliant? So I haven't been in that position yet, but mm -hmm. there's been the opposite where I've looked at some things and I'm like, oh, that's not Sharia compliant. So mm -hmm. I haven't invested. And then I've gone back. Yeah. I, I've fine. gone back to check and it, and it is. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be lying if I said I fully understand their methodology of screening. I, re yeah. I don't really too much. Yeah. I probably should. Mostly, yeah, yeah I, 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 I kind of get some elements of it. Mm. I know a lot of it is going to be a Qiyas because there isn't, I think some of the, I could be completely wrong the way I'm saying this, but like some of the... Um, the rules that they follow are based on like PS on some a hadith. For example, like there's this 33% sort of, where is it? Like interest bearing debt, for example, if it's below 33% or something like that, then it's mm. permissible. But that's yeah. based on a particular hadith that ne not necessarily said that word for word. It was just an interpretation. Oh yeah. 30% here. Mm. So the amount of deposit, so interest bearing securities, for example, the amount of deposit investments or debt a company extends with the aim of receiving interest on it should not exceed 30% of its market cap. Now there's some, some, uh, some Muslim sort of investors I see online, they will say, where's that 30% come from? That's such an arbitrary number. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then other people of knowledge will say they'll derive it from a particular hadith. I can't really name, I can't, you know, read that hadith for you right now, mm -hmm. but you know, they've drawn that number yeah. from somewhere in the text. Yeah. Um, and some argue that's not relevant. Some argue mm. that that's what we're going to base it on because that's the closest mm. thing we can do. But, yeah. I, you know, once again, we are laymen and there's people of knowledge that yeah. are looking enough. So what can we do? Unless yeah. we study yeah. ourselves. I, uh, I actually have Zoya open now. I've got this watch list. So oh, yeah. uh, I was just looking at the companies I was watching. I, I did. I opened an account. It was so much hassle, to be honest, to open an account with, uh, I think it's Interactive Brokers. They're one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to, to sign up for it 
as though like I'm fully living in uh, UAE and I've got nothing to do with the UK. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I went through them and it was so many agreements. And I, was, I, was, I was not really comfortable with all these no. things I'm signing and I'm guessing like my details are stored in the US somewhere now and all of that. Um, yeah. And in the end, I, I put $100 into my account and I was like, yeah, let me just play around with it. So I bought um, two shares, I think it was of Slack at the time. And then I kind of just left it. I thought, you know, it's not really for me. Um, and then later I got uh, on Zoya. It's like, oh, Slack is not Sharia compliant now. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh right. Yeah. What am I doing? No, how do I now have to log in? Because it's even to log in, it was so much security. Really? It was a bit um, annoying to log in. And uh, then I sold it, uh, I think, you know, months, a few months later at a small loss. And then, uh, yeah. And now Slack is, I think Slack is booming right now because. Um, it says at the moment it's... Salesforce uh, said they might buy it or something. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. It says it's Sharia compliant now. And there yeah, is no, a is, um, yeah. there's some I haven't read it. Um, mm. I can't remember what I read. It was a while ago since I read it, but they, there is some sort of Sharia guidance on terms of if something does go, does turn, you know, impermissible or non-compliant, mm -hmm. what to do with it. So there's guidance in in that aspect. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose there is that element. I mean, they say that you're not going to just sell and give all your money mm. to charity if it changes, and you can obviously keep your profits mm. and stuff. Yeah, because um, it's quarter to quarter with these companies, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So they exactly. might announce that. Oh, now we have more than thirty percent uh, interest bearing batli. Yeah, and they might have already had that for two months, and you just didn't know because they announce it every three months. So yeah, uh, yeah. But what what do you think, bro? Like Let's say they have twenty nine percent, right? Yep. Like I don't know if I'm fully comfortable with that. Like even though the the ruling perhaps is that that's still halal, but it's like, do you want to be involved in the bottom? I think the bottom line is, you know, at least for me, mm. there's two elements: there's the Sharia compliance, and then there's what that company is. You know, uh -huh. now I think it's easy to just forget what companies are when you're just too busy looking at you know, the compliance and the interest and all that sort of, and the price and stuff. Yeah. But then what does that actually company, what does that company do? <laughs> that's, that's something that you can easily get swept up on, especially when you're like buying into hype and stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause it's quickly like, you hear all these like tickets and was all these companies getting bounced about in forums and forums and stuff. And then you're like, Oh, what, what actually is this company? And you look into it and they're like, Oh, they work for the military or they, you know, <laughs> counter terrorism or all this other yeah. stuff. Like, you know, I was you, looking at one you're, you're recently, about Palantir, right? Yeah. Stuff like that. Like, yeah. and I was just like, Palantir, oh, you don't want to invest in Palantir. <laughs> yeah. So stuff like that, bro. And, um, mm. or in general, in general, in general, it's just, yeah. it's, you just need to know what you're doing, but also, mm. um, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to be a traditionalist and be a bit, bit, bit patient. You know, it's easy to get sucked into, um, you know, the hype of like, oh, this company in the last three months has shot up two hundred percent in stock price. Mm -hmm. or, uh, which one's that? I saw one earlier. Mm. Uh, I saw Zoom was over three hundred percent in the last year. Yeah, mm. we've got Neo, for example, which is like a, a Chinese electric vehicle manufacturer. In the last mm. three months, has shot up two hundred and seventy-four percent. You know, now you can, and then that compared to I don't know, Google, it says here in the last six months, it's twenty-five percent. You know. Mm. Um, Amazon last six months, 23%. Um, so it's easy to get caught up in it. But <clears throat> I think, yeah, bro, it's a lot of, we, we, we're not shy to say that there's a lot of power behind money, bro, and especially for the Muslims who want to do the right thing and want to mm. invest in other things. Okay? Mm. And I, I, do you know what? I'll be honest with you. The biggest benefit that this has all taught me has been nothing to do with my dunya and it's more to do with my akhira because mm. what it's allowed me to do in my eyes is visualize what investing in the Akhira looks like, okay. you know? So in the same way that there are obviously very easy to use investing apps and stuff like that, there are very easy to use charity platforms. Mm. Um, one that I've been looking at recently is called, um, well, I forgot what it's called. It's Share the Meal, I think it's called. Okay. Share, yeah, it's called Share the Meal. And it's, it's I think it's run by the like, United Nations Food Program. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as I can tell, it's just about feeding people. Mm -hmm. And um, it's literally like one tap Apple Pay sort of ease mm -hmm. of use donation. So you literally just swipe to whatever you want to donate to, click give now, right? And then there's like this big slider mm -hmm. that will just show you. So like I'm looking at feeding families in Nigeria. Yeah? Uh, feed a child for one day is 65p. Mm -hmm. I can slide that up uh, 
feed the child for one week is £4.55. I'll slide it up to the maximum. Mm. Feed a child for, it's giving me here, one year and four months and 15 days is £325. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it, the, you can just visualize that very easily because it gives you like little um, yeah, pictures yeah. and stuff. And you just tap. It's one tap, bro. No details, no like, oh, like one of the biggest barriers of entry, I think, for giving charity is like every time I have to give charity to some com- some organization, it's like, oh, you can't remember your login because you don't you use so many different yeah. ones. You can't remember it. Okay, sign up as a guest, put in all your details, put in your address, put in your bank details. Put, do you know what I mean? And before you know mm-hmm. it, like it's like such a hassle. Mm-hmm. And I know it's, you know, it shouldn't be. I know, you know, you still should give. Mm-hmm. But with something so easy, it's like almost like contactless, bro. You just tap. Boom, yeah. Apple Pay, all your details are stored on your phone anyway. And then mm-hmm. you've just done it. Like it took mm-hmm. a few seconds to do that. And then what it does is it, it you can check on your account and it visualizes how much you've given. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can just think about that as a as another investment in your echelon as opposed to just sitting there. So when you get excited about seeing that m- amount as time builds, mm-hmm. you get excited about seeing that amount because you think SubhanAllah may Allah accept that from me. Um, and you know, I try and I try and encourage um, the the brothers that I speak to to visualize you know their echelon in that same way to visualize it as you know an investment in the same way that we we invest in our dunya mm-hmm. um, because. You know, you get excited about what's going on now, but you should be getting more excited about what's going on then, you mm. know. Makes you think as well, like, if you're going to give your time to something, um, do you want to give your time to something that will just uh, be around, you know, you kind of, inshallah, get sadaqah jariah for it for the next year? Or, mm. you know, if you see some kind of project which has so many promising people behind it, then you might almost be, like, fighting to get into involved in that because... yeah. Uh, it's like I think of my partner Muhammad, who was involved with Ayera from day one. Yeah. Um, and imagine that, like being even if he was only I can't remember how many years he was involved, but if you built the foundations of something which today is like doing so much dawah, yeah, you're probably going to reap the rewards. So that is a very different from something which fizzles out after a year. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, this is it, bro. Like you can literally visualize. Like imagine, imagine. <laughs> imagine something like Ayera on the on the stock market of deeds, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that's that's what you visualize. Like you bought into mm-hmm. it when there was nothing. It was zero essentially because yeah. it didn't start. And then mm-hmm. now it's like everything that's every good that it's done, inshallah, every person that's been guided, mm-hmm. um, you're getting some part of that, some cut of that, some dividends of that. And it's you know, it's nuts when you think about it. You know, if we could mm-hmm. put a, a price on it, if someone could make like an animation visualizing that, it'd be incredible. Yeah, yeah. And even, I don't know, I think of some of, uh, I think the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he wrote those books and they were kind of lost. Um, yeah. And then later they were kind of recompiled. And, uh, you know, hundreds of years after his death. And so the, if you look at the, the graph for that, it would be like, you know, flat for hundreds mm. of years. Mm. And then all of a sudden people are like re, you know, reading his work and benefiting from it and teaching from it. People doing good deeds because of what they learned etc um then it would like shoot up hockey stick style you know yes <laughs> so it's crazy yeah to think of it that way as well um yeah i just think i don't know maybe i think financially wise like obviously i'm already in business so you know when you're in business versus having a job i think your investments are going to be different because maybe you need something I, I mean, this, this, it's not like it's risky to invest in the stock market. Maybe it's a bit risky to invest in specific stocks, but I feel like if you're uh, in business, you've got to be a bit uh, risk averse when it comes to your investments because you're already yeah. risk averse by being in business. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I yeah. think I was very close to doing the whole Wahid investing, but when I looked at or some of like, the funds that the money is going into, some of the companies there were like ExxonMobil and uh, McDonald's and stuff like that. And I just... It might be halal technically, but I was like, mm, not really for me. So I think really, yeah. I'm kind of maybe going more towards real estate, uh, which will require more patience and building up cash, obviously. Um, see, this is it for me. Like, I see this as groundwork for that sort of stuff in the future. You know, I, I yeah, I, can't I, get I get to what that. you mean. Yeah, because yeah. it's like I can't get liquid. to that unless I start here. Yeah, yeah, because because um, you can sell at any day, in it. Yeah, like yeah. just now, as we were speaking. Mm. I sold something and bought something else because it was just there <laughs> sitting because I had a bit of a, 
moment. But I can do that. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Like that's how easy it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose that's just the nature of technology. However, you know what? I'm very pessimistic, bro. I don't think this stuff lasts forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm a firm believer that we're going to have some sort of mad apocalypse not in the, not, not too long in the future. Yeah. And um, yeah, all of this stuff that we sort of hedge our bets on and, and invested and, you know, it's just, mm. it's, you know, the, the, the foundations that we, we built our world on are very, very flimsy, actually. Mm. Um, our lost planet Isla has destroyed many civilizations before us and, Allah knows best how long we've got left and we know we know we've, we know elements of what the future hold you know and i think it's easy to get lulled into this sort of fantasy or that we're going to be here for thousands of years when the world look i mean look what covid did in what a few months bro mm -hmm. um and that could have been way deadlier than it is mm -hmm. you know and what's stopping a lost planet Allah from creating any more fit now that then you know yeah be, beyond what's already been prophesized mm. you know what I mean? this, this it's like sort of you know, when you think of a much harder time, whether it's purely economically or there's like war or whatever it is, yeah, you think of um, Imani preparation, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel like the only thing really that would get me through that, because I don't feel like I'm a tough person in the first place. I haven't had a some kind of tough upbringing that would really toughen me. Yeah. Um, I think I have a good mindset and I can change my mindset to adapt to a difficult time, inshallah. Right. But but ultimately, the thing that will get you through things the easiest is is going to be your iman, like pure iman in terms of, yeah. for example, you know, some people like, I don't know, lose a child and they're, they're just say, alhamdulillah, you know, this kind of, that's not toughness, I would say. I would say that's purely the gift of iman, you yeah. know, being able to hack um, so many different things. You know, some people are losing a leg, getting paralyzed, becoming blind and and just uh, being kind of kind of okay with it. And I feel like so. So I feel like my preparation for any hard time it needs to be done now. In you know mm. how, what? How am I connecting to the Quran? How am I doing uh, my extra ibadah? And you know this is the preparation for that kind of hardship. You know, and it's, I think it's it's good to just it's it's good to pick what you want to sort of be known for. What's easy for you to do and and like maximize that. I mean, it's quite fortunate that. Good deeds are good deeds, no matter what they are, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, for example, if one person struggles with Quran, for example, mm -hmm. right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created many different avenues for us to, to earn his pleasure, you mm -hmm. know. One person may be good at, like, really good at using, you know, their their, their voice, for example, to to spread the doubt. Or one may be really good at using, uh, maybe financially wealthy to, to give in charity. One person may be really good at, you know, obviously, like, for certain Quran, for example, or memorizing. All these other, all these avenues, there's so many things mm -hmm. you can do. And then there's obviously your day-to-day. -day. Like, just you living your day-to-day -day as a Muslim, being good to other people, smiling, um, you know. Parents, the, yeah. the Parents, all these avenues, Akhi. Um, you know, one could dedicate their life to their parents. One could literally do that. One could make that decision and be like, I'm going to, you know, visit them every day, do everything they need for them, literally treat them like, you know, do go that extra mile in something mm -hmm. specifically. Because it's, it's, you know, I think that we want to do a bit of everything. But it's kind of like business. If you had many businesses, you're, all, you're going to get hit about, you know, a certain percentage on all of them. But if you pick that one thing that you want to be known for, mm -hmm. that one thing that like shining a light, Yom Al-Qiyamah, yeah. Like that that appeals to me. It's not saying that you don't do the other stuff. When they come mm. to you, you do you. When they come to you, you do them. But I, there's, I've always had it in my mind, at least, that there's this one thing that I want to pursue actively, yeah, um, more than anything. And that yeah. way, I can, you know, that can be my my banner on Yom Al Qiyamah bin Yeah, you're right, man. Like you 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 got so, so many of these things that stand out. Like you can't imagine that really doing your utmost for your parents you'd ever you know be a loser on your maqiyama after yeah, that, yeah, right? yeah. and yeah. then you've got like fasting where uh, there's a special gate to jannah for those for that do the fasting you know mm. um then i think i can't remember that there's a certain reward for those who like stay constantly in wudu yeah um so there's like so many like you know we don't even maybe know them all but subhanallah um yeah bro um do you want to cover that question and then we'll wrap up after that? Yeah, let's have a look. Uh, yeah. Let me bring it up. Do I have, I am logged in. Maybe I'll just read this email quick that we had. It's more like feedback just because it's been here since July. Go for it. So, 
So uh, the sister emailed us about our episode, I think it was 82, the Black Lives Matter one. She just said that, oh, you removed the episode. And then she said, you know, you should bring it back because it's beneficial. I want to share it. But then I, I asked, uh, I said, you know, we brought it back, but what's your feedback and stuff? She said, I listened to it. I thought it was good. So did my mom and sister as well. I read a few comments on the video and saw some people didn't like what was said, though. So Allah knows best what's correct. I agree with Echi tweet on not living up to your own negative stereotypes and Allah knows best. May Allah forgive us and guide us to correct un correct understanding. Amin. Amin. So that's just some feedback. Just so we can say that we uh, deal with every single email. <laughs> but actually, uh, at that time, I did really appreciate this kind of feedback to know where we stand with people. <laughs> no, it's good, bro. It's good. I think I, I don't think we do enough to engage with our audience, to be honest. I always forget that we've got one. <laughs> I know it sounds really bad, but I've... I, I'm so used to obviously just speaking to you that mm. I wish there was a, a better way we could bring people more involved. Mm. I don't know what we could do mm. unless live I don't know, maybe see yeah, a live stream and have a chat thing in the, but I don't want that to distract me, you know, mm. from the conversations that we have. Yeah. Um, so I yeah, think, I, I think the only we're open, like we don't have tons of emails and, and, you know, curious can and everything. Um, and we do get around to everything, but I think, yeah. if, you know, if we had a lot more then it might be like, once a month, we always do a pure Q and A episode or something like that. That'd be good, actually. Um, I see a lot of podcasts do like after shows where they start, you know, discussing things with their audience. So like they'll do an hour or whatever mm -hmm. of um, you know normal podcasts, and then like after the hour mark, they'll open up, mm. you know, the, That's the discussion with the audience and That's stuff like quite, that. That sounds quite sick. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if we have time for that, but yeah, no, we'll That's see. Inshallah. Yeah. Right. Uh, this brother has emailed us. Let me read it out. I've been following your podcast for a while now and I have been really enjoying it. Mashallah. I wanted to suggest a podcast topic surrounding death, the reality of it, the reward of contemplating it, visiting the graves, financial responsibility of the man after death, i.e. Um, the will. I believe in terms of the will, it's something that a lot of Muslims don't have. And it's kind of awkward for the children to ask their parents about it. For example, I myself have asked about it and my parents, may Allah have mercy on them, brush it to the side and jokingly say, do you want me to die? Um, mm. Jazakallah khair, your brother in Islam, Rafa'i, I think it says. My mm -hmm. Arabic text on here is not very big. Um, yeah, Rafa'i. Yes, the will. Let's start on that because that was something that came to my mind a few nights ago, um, mm -hmm. I was sort of in bed, like trying to fall asleep. And it kind of struck me because it's something that's been on my mind for ages. I know it's something that I need to do. And I think I've always been a bit daunted by it because I don't feel like I have any guidance around me to teach me how it should be done properly. Yeah. Right. Um, so I was always a bit confused as to whether there's like, do I have to write out all my stuff, how I see it should be split up? Or is it, is there like a, um, is there like a, you know, a Sharia allocation system I have to abide by, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think there's a standard way, then there's a way if you're living in a non-Muslim country. Okay. Um, so the standard way is if you die in a Muslim country, then they should divide your stuff up according to the Sharia. Right. Um, and then you should still have a wasiya though. And a wasiya is different from a will. Um, you don't, we don't have wills in Islam because Allah already decided how things should be divided, but okay. you can have a wasiya, which is, uh, it's, you know, advice to your family, you know, after you're dead, it's, okay. uh, stuff like, or oh, I don't know, I want to be buried here or I want to be, you know, be buried next to this person or, um, you know, make sure you pay all my debts back or, you know, I right. want, you know, and you've, uh, in the Sharia, you know, you're allowed a certain amount of your wealth that you can allocate to people, um, yeah. uh, which goes outside of the realms of the inheritance law that already exists. So, let's say you've got 10k pounds. I believe it's it, I believe it's one third. Um, I need to re revise this, but I believe one third of that, so like 3,333 pounds, you can say, I want to give this to my cousin. Right, even though your cousin might not be, have the right to your inheritance, but because it's less than 30% or a third, sorry, um, you can actually write in your wasiya that I want him to have that. 
But you can't say, I want him to have half because no, now you're taking away the rights of the people who Allah has decided should have, you know? Um, so you basically it, make it in line with what's, what's legislated in that sense. Yeah, but within what's legislated, you, you, can, you can give some money or property or whatever away, but there's a limit to it. You can't like give all your, like imagine you, you have sons, right? And you yeah. have a wife. So, and you have parents. So you're, I, I don't know about parents, but if you die now, uh, according to Sharia, you know, they all get portions, okay? According to what Allah okay. has already decided. Uh, but what if you wanted to give to your cousin, right? Right. You can give that, but you have to write it in the wasiyah and it can't be more than, I think it's a third. Right, okay? I understand. And therefore that two thirds that's remaining, you know, they, those, your wife, your kids, they must absolutely get that. So okay. there's a limit, like you could say that Allah has decided the inheritance allocation, and, but there is a limit, a level of flexibility in terms of, oh no, I definitely want to make sure this and that. Um, so that's what I know. So what would happen, I guess, is if you die in a Muslim country, um, they would divide it, you know, uh, with your, your siblings, your, your parents, your kids. Yeah. And, this and, that. and then it's like, okay, what does a wasiyah say? If you don't have wasiyah, then obviously, not, I don't, you know, Nothing's really binding, is it? Like, you should have written it down. Um, this is what. So yeah, um, obviously, yeah. we have a lot of these discussions with my family because obviously my dad and stuff, and it's always been a discussion. But I think from what I remember, in Tunisia, it's still all done by Sharia, so yeah. it's kind of covered in that aspect. I just yeah. don't really know what the dealio is over here. Yeah, exactly. You know? So over there, I think what you need is you need a will because in the UK right. they're not going to say. Uh, you know, okay, your wife's share is like one third or whatever, because yeah. they don't have that. So you need a will which states the proportions according to the Sharia, right. and then it'll be like a UK legal thing that is accepted in court. Right. I, get um, you. I think another, it may be an easier way, is you could have a joint bank account with whatever your mum, for example, and yeah. then your mum like knows that yeah, she has to divide it according to Sharia. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Yeah. It's, because it's weird. Like with a joint account, obviously she has full access to that money, just how you would, because it's joint. Yeah. I think there's um, I don't know if there is enough online there. I, thought, I remember hearing, I think actually we spoke about um, Stead Joe Bradford earlier. I remember he was advertising. Yeah, like so a, he's a, got a, mywasia uh, dot com. Right. I think it is. Uh, that would work. Uh, I think it's only for U.S. law. So what yeah. that does is it allows you to create a wasia online. And that acts as the will and the wasiya in one, because it's for people who live in the US. Um, and, and I wonder, I always wonder if that sort of stuff is quite, is that for the everyday man or is that for people that just have a lot of stuff, you know, like, mm. you know, property and, and stuff like that. Like, I don't have any of that, but like, but I've got items, for example, that I would yeah. like to be passed to specific people. Um, and obviously I've got my, my kids. Yeah. Um, but Certain stuff, yeah, I, but you know, you I, know I, mean? I feel like because I wrote Wasiya when I went to Hajj, uh, was it last? Well, it's not the last Hajj, the one before, obviously. Okay. Um, so I thought, you know, it, I don't know, it felt like the right time to, to write it, and I knew that I should have written it uh, before that, but I was like, yeah, let me just get this done here, let me do it. So I wrote it, and you know, maybe I don't know too much about it, but it, it's partially advice, um, that you would, you know, like mm. if you if you want to leave your wife with like you know, some, some, like, obviously you would give your wife tons of maybe advice, but you know, like when you're dead, what is the like one, two, three things that you really want her to remember, you know, yeah. from you. So you write that and then the same for your kids and the, you know, same for that. So it's like advice, but then it's also stuff like, you know, um, Oh, I owe money to this guy. Make sure you pay him back. And you know, you know what, yeah. do you know, do you know what my wife said to me recently? Mm. well she alluded to this i can't remember how she said it but she said that like maybe like our biggest wasi is is going to be this podcast bro <laughs> mm. because i mean your kids can get to know how you think from it yeah definitely like imagine if you were able to just like go back and listen to your your own parents thoughts at whatever age you know mm -hmm. just see how they thought of things because i don't know about you but um yeah, I don't really get to speak to my dad like in a very transparent. He's not very transparent with me. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's um, like what the brother said. Uh, Do you want me to die? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, and I don't know how transparent I'm going to be with my my kids. I mean, they're quite young, obviously, mm. but we'll see. But but maybe mm. 
you know, if I'm not transparent with them, or maybe if like, I don't know, they might listen to this in the future. And I don't know, have some sort of idea of who I was and my mm, thought process and stuff definitely. like that. Especially on like such a vast amount of topics, bro. Because yeah, ninety six you know, episodes. Man. Actually, 90, these ninety six episodes, I don't, I can't think of, you know, ten percent of these, oh, maybe ninety percent of the, the topics we've spoken about on here. I don't think I've ever spoken to my dad about. Mm, exactly. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what his opinion is on these things. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see. Here you go, bro. Like. I've just found this service which I came across uh, maybe a year ago. It's fairwill.com. Okay. Fairwheel.com. Fairwheel.com. And you'll like it, bro. It's like the it's like the Monzo of Wills. Oh yeah. Um and, like and this it's not Islamic per se. Um, so maybe you get someone to help you fill it out properly in a proper way. But it's like very just like digital. Write a, a will online in as little as 15 minutes. Um, and this okay. is like based on UK law and stuff like that. Fairwheel. So oh, like that. I think I've got some sort of service at work. That I've got like all these like bonuses and services mm. and stuff that prior to, but I never really look into them. Yeah. But you know what? Ultimately, getting back to his email, mm -hmm. um, it's something that yeah we should all think about. Like nothing's yeah. promised, bro. Yeah, and um, I think uh, you know because of the uh, Western understanding of a will, people think, oh, I don't have much money. Why would I write a will? But like we said, like wasia is different to a will. It's not just about money. It's yeah. about many things. Um, you know, you might want to say, oh, I, I forgive so-and-so or ask so-and-so to forgive me because now I'm dead or, you know. Mm. So as far as I understand, it's like very open in what you can say there. Um, yeah, bro, even, I think it's... even like, you know, we got to think of this in 2020 that we've got a huge digital footprint. So it's mm. like, oh, who do you want to take over Mind Heist when you're dead? You know, um, oh. what's your logins? You know, do you want to delete your social media? Do you want someone to maintain it? Yeah, um, true all of this stuff it's, it's actually quite significant and important true 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 yeah like uh, passwords um bank accounts uh things you need to pay off bro even something as simple as like cancelling direct debits you know mm -hmm. people don't only really think about that you're going to be like absolutely ruined in grief um yeah i've yeah. dealt with many families that have lost loved ones or stuff quite suddenly and it's just like it gets very messy and they ask you yeah. questions and you don't really know what to say to them because they should have thought about it beforehand yeah yeah one thing that I'm not sure about is like how, like you've written a wasiya, right? Like how much authority do your family have to implement that? Like in the UK, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's difficult. Surely you need like a legal document. That, that... This is, yeah, I don't, this is why I'd like to be able to have it, you know, I'd like to be able to be educated on this properly. Yeah. Um, but, ultimately so it's just was it just that no i think it was in general thinking about death in general yeah. wasn't it yeah um the benefits of doing so uh let me bring it up again i got uh, yeah it's a, the, the reality of it the reality Bro, of death i got a story for, for you for i don't really i don't really i don't really share a lot from work but i'll share this story mm -hmm. a few days ago um must have been two or three days ago uh this guy was going to kill himself, bro, like at the top of a car park. Mm. He'd like climbed to the top, I think it was like 14 floors or whatever. Wow. 14 floor car park. He was standing on the edge, bro. I managed to talk him down. And then he ran after like, after he did that, he sort of like changed his mind and ran back to the wall to jump off. Mm. Bro, I rugby tackled him like absolute, like, <laughs> like no care in the world. Sure. And alhamdulillah, like managed to stop him and stuff and obviously get him to a hospital and the help that he needed. Um, but then it just made me think, bro, like and that, that happened twice in one day. So that was my occasion, but a, a colleague of mine had somebody on the cliffs and they were even more precarious, bro. Like they were slipping off and there was like wow. rubble falling down and stuff. And I think they changed their mind halfway through, but they were already like sort of too far gone slipping off. Oh um, they had to drag them back over. And it just made me think like, just it obviously makes you think about death a lot. It makes you think about the sort of things that people are going through and it makes it kind of um i think what it intimidated me it was what they expect to happen when they're in that state like what is they what do they think the next 10 seconds are going to be you know it's like when you go traveling somewhere you land at the airport right and then when you open those airport doors and you're out you sort of have this image of what you're going to experience there right yeah 
and um I don't know, you ever been to like Algeria in the summer? As soon as you get out of the air conditioned airport, like the heat hits you, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of vibe. Um, no, for me, Algeria is cooler than UAE. So, <laughs> is it? Oh, maybe UAE then is a better example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it makes me think, like, SubhanAllah, what do these, what do these guys like think? Um, like, what do they visualize? What are they imagining? And I know yeah. it's, it's complex. It's a lot mm. of mental health stuff. It's I a think, lot of, I think, uh, you know, obviously, just kind of a guess or, from wherever, whatever's in my head. But I think they don't think of where they're going. I think yeah. just they're tr- what they're escaping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, so true. It's like, it's like this current place I'm in is so bad that surely that wouldn't be worse. Yeah. I just find it hard to, even if I try and think back to when I wasn't necessarily practicing or conscious of Islam that much, I, I struggle with the concept that your consciousness just vanishes. Like it doesn't... Mm it's really hard that to sit with me. Um, Yeah. I mean, (laughs) that's a shock, isn't it? If you think that you just won't exist after, after you die uh, and then, and then obviously you do. Um, And it's a really like, because I've had in my head where I don't know how I've come to it, but like, I can't believe that your consciousness would ever cease because why would my consciousness exist right now? You know, but then some people say, well, in the same way that, you don't remember when before you were born, you know, that's how you mm-hmm. won't exist sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But then it just makes this moment between life and death, very fleeting, you know, but between your birth and death, like completely like weird and like this weird sort of, you know, moment in time, mm-hmm. you know, um, weird, but no, like I said, um, yeah, death, bro. If you, if you can expose yourself to it, then it's going to benefit you um, in a lot of ways. And it's, it's very grounding, you know, because um, mm. it's easy to get caught up and it's easy to forget. It's easy to just live and plan and and, and just keep going. Mm-hmm. There's something that I missed uh, when I used to live ne- near um, ELM. Yeah. Uh, they had Janazah there every single day at Dhuhr, every single yeah. day, pretty much. And you're just praying Janazah every day. Whereas in UAE, it's like, never for some reason i don't i don't, I don't really? know i don't know why uh i i think in the uae i prayed janaza to like very few times in in one specific like very big masjid but right it was like no one died out there it's weird man mm. i think actually come to think of it if the system they might have over there is that they bring the body to the graveyard and there's a masjid near the graveyard and they always pray it there Possibly right. that's what they do. But that just means that it's very limited, the people that pray over you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and he, uh, for me, I feel like that's one level is praying Janazah. Another yeah. level is like where you're actually, you know, burying the body and that, you know, digging the grave and all of that. That's like even more a higher level, I would say. Um, but, you know, I don't know about you. I, don't, I really don't do that hardly you know i think i did it when i went hajj i did it in, yeah. in medina that was a you know a powerful experience because you're it was in uh Baqiyah, you know the graveyard yeah. where the sahaba are and stuff and uh you know we're, we're like everyone's like fighting to dig because there's a big reward for that and stuff uh but other than that like when was the last time i did that yeah i've never done it in the uk bro i've never prayed to janaza in the uk um really like not, yeah like janaza Never, yeah, Genesis. never, wow. never done a Genesis in the UK. Um, yeah, I think. I guess not many masajid around you, right? So there's only one masjid that I attend, yeah. and the few times that there have been Genesis, I haven't been able to go. It might have been because I was at work or whatever. Um, mm. But yeah, but when I'm obviously abroad, it happens it's all the time, and I'm always involved in there. In um, so yeah, it's I always associate death a lot with. Muslim, the Muslim world, because mm. for a long time I wasn't exposed to it in the UK. Like, it was two things. Two things I never did in the UK were weddings and funerals, bro. Mm. <laughs> like, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a. I wasn't tied to any community. So, both weddings and funerals were things that never happened in mm. in the UK for me. Um, so, alhamdulillah, I've managed to catch a few weddings, but I haven't caught any Janazas yet. Mm. Um, but yeah, when I go to obviously Tunisia or Morocco or even Algeria, I'm sure I've, I've only been there once, but I'm mean, even if I went more often, I'm sure it'd be the same. Like Genesis is all the time. And, mm. and it's, um, it's interesting, I suppose, to see that's when the spirituality comes out, you know, 
That's when yeah. the Quran gets played. Like I remember when I first started practicing, I went to Tunisia, bro, and I started playing the Quran out loud, like in my room or something. And yeah. people were like, oh, someone died. I was like, what do you mean yeah. someone died? But that's what they do. Like if somebody mm. dies, that's when the Quran comes on. Mm. It's like, oh, that's a bit bad. Mm. <laughs> you know well, that, I mean? that shows you, I guess, the power of the topic, isn't it? Of, yeah. Of death. Yeah. 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 True. Because even if you avoid your obligations to Allah in the rest of your life, it's like it feels right to that in you know time of death you remember. Yeah, yeah, it's partner. Yeah. Mm. You've got to think about it. You've got to put it, you've got to just remind yourself a lot. It's it's so easy though, isn't it? It's so easy to forget um mm. and to get caught up. I always I get really angry with myself when um I notice that I haven't thought about it in a while. Um, because in that while it could have happened to me. Mm, yeah. That's what always annoys me. It's like I could have a week where it just hasn't crossed my mind like actively, and then I'll get really frustrated that in that week, any time that week, I could have gone. Yeah. You know, and every time I leave the house, I'm not that you can't die in the house, but I always obviously think about the last time I see my family. I always think about every time I go out for work, bro. I obviously say bye to my kids, and I try and make it meaningful because I actively think this could be it. I don't know why it always hits me, mm-hmm. but I just think, oh, this could be it. And then I want to to have that in the forefront of my mind, mm-hmm. um, you know, during that process. Um, I think it's good to remind yourself before you set off on any task. It's hard to do it whilst you're doing something, you know. Mm-hmm. So like I just said, like before I start work, I have a bit of a ritual in the sense of like the duas I make, the sort of thoughts that are in my head, the prepar- the mental preparation I have for work is that. And then at, during work and stuff, I'm maybe not thinking about it too much unless, you know, th- th- something happens that triggers it. But it's always like, you know, if I'm starting a project, if I'm starting a journey, if I'm going somewhere, the beginning, I always have to think of death because I just think, okay, this could be the last thing I do. This mm. thing could be the last place I go. It's harder, I think, the most, the hardest thing that I'm trying to do is try and implement that into my salat. So like, this could be the last prayer I do. I find that quite difficult to do, although it's, you know, a goal that I have. Mm. Um, but I came across a photo um, on Twitter yesterday. Don't know where it was. Some sort of Muslim country, uh, maybe, you know, in the olden days. But it was a, a Muslim man who was about to be executed um, by Europeans. That's what they look like. And he was praying his last, last prayer and there was a photo of him. And I just wow. thought, oh, I just thought, oh. <laughs> yeah, I saw that posted today. Seen it. He was yeah. uh, an Ottoman uh soldier i think he's gonna get executed by a ah. bulgarian i think yeah yeah that's what it is i think yeah and that that really made me think i saw that yesterday and it made me think like i wonder if i've ever prayed a prayer like he's praying his right now you oh, know yeah. Yeah. um and i wonder if he was able to attain the the khushur that he wanted in that final prayer mm-hmm. i want like i was really deeply thinking about what he was thinking about how actively was he actually you know, what was he more connected with? Was he connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Was he connected with the fear that he was about to be executed? Like what was going through his mind? And I was trying to read his body language and I was looking at how he's placed his hands. And I, I don't know, I just thought, I was, I was staring at that picture for ages, just thinking about it. Mm. Um, like, have I ever come close to praying like that? Is that something that I could ever do? And, and then it makes you think, like if I was ever given that opportunity to at least pray one last prayer before doing so, mm-hmm. um, how would how would I be? Would I let myself down? You know, would I be distracted? Would I have prepared for that moment all that time? All this time I've had alive, have I prepared enough for that moment where I I may be given an opportunity? Mm. You know? That's kind of how I felt. Um, you know, in Hajj uh, mm. on the day of Arafah, yeah, you've got from about what was it Dhuhr till Maghrib? Yeah, you've got Dhuhr till Maghrib. That's where you make a dua. And this yeah. is the day of Arafah when, you know, the most du'a is accepted, etc. And, uh, you know, it's not much time. And you think, who knows, I'll do another Hajj in my life. Yeah. And so the pressure's on, basically. Obviously, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. probably not the same as, uh, you know, you know you're going to die or something. But I, even in that time, you know, I was really trying, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was yeah. really trying. But there were moments where I wanted to, like, quote unquote take a break if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. And uh I'm like, come on, man. You've got like four hours or whatever. 
yeah. just make dua for four hours you like you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't you need a break <laughs> like come on you know you may, may never have this opportunity again um so i mean i i, I don't know i give myself for maybe a, a 7.5 out of 10 for for that for, for like what i ended up yeah. being able to do but you, you then you know the when maghrib got, comes you know the then for maghrib then you start thinking huh you know maybe i could have got a nine out of ten you know yeah 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 um but allah's allah's uh, merciful and inshallah you know he accepts from us these things you know if your heart's in the right place and you know effort like we know our effort levels that's what i'm saying mm. my effort you know I, i'll give myself a 7.5 maybe um is that good enough? I don't know. For something that you do maybe once in your life, maybe not. I don't know. But yeah. Wow. So that's that's a taste, I guess. Inshallah, um, you know, it gives people the listeners uh, something to think about, I suppose. It gives me something to think about differently. Mm, yeah. And and that kind of moment, yeah, and it, obviously we don't know when we're gonna die, but that kind of thing we could create it artificially every day isn't it like you're saying you know you walk out the house you don't know if you're coming back um, yeah and i think there is a hadith about like praying the prayer like it's your last prayer and imagining i think it was imagining jannah on your on your right and jahannam on your left or something like that i think there's a hadith about like the kind of prayer where you're really fully focused and stuff um so it might be good to look into that one and really thinking as though this is my last prayer. Like, yeah, I think it's like praying a prayer where the angel of death is like right there waiting to take your, your soul or something, uh-huh. something like that. Um, but, but also, bro, on the topic of death, there is this thing of kind of preparing for death, right? Mm. And, uh, you know, li- obviously living your life in a way where when you die, inshallah, It'll be, you know, la khawfun alaykum wa la wa la hum yahsaloon. I'm mixing up different ayahs, I think, there. But um, also this this hadith, uh, I feel like this hadith kind of gives us an answer to some of the problems we feel we're in as an ummah. Mm. It's a very famous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is talking about, um, you know, the people will uh, gather to attack you, like like people eating, coming to share a dish. You know, yes, uh, this, this uh, hadith, and the, obviously the Sahaba said, you know, will will we be few at that time? And he said, so, so, um, no, you'll be numerous, but you'll be like the froth on the sea. Mm. Um, so you know, basically, kind of worthless or no weight to you, no substance to you, etc. And um, interestingly, he says, let me just find the word the. Yes, yeah. وَلَا يَنْزِعَنَّ اللَّهُ مِنْ صُدُورِ عَدُوِكُمْ الْمَهَابَةَ What's that word mean? الْمَهَابَةَ الْمَهَابَةَ مِنْكُمْ So uh, in the translation it says, Allah will take the fear of you from the breasts of your enemy. Okay, so therefore, obviously the enemy won't fear you anymore because I guess you have no substance. And, and then... Uh, then someone asked, oh no, sorry. So Allah will take the, the fear of you out of the, 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 the chest of the en- your enemies. So, okay, so your enemies won't fear you anymore. And uh, wahan from, from, it will be put into your hearts. Mm. Yeah, so we, uh, yeah, I think many people heard this word before wahan and you know, the, the, the Sahabi asked, what's wahan? Um, and then he says, um, love of the world and dislike of death. Dislike mm. of death. So it's like uh, you've got to prepare for death and you've got to kind of not, you've got to not want death to come at the wrong time. But according to this hadith, disliking death is actually part of the reason that we might be, you know, not in the best position in the dunya, you know what I mean? Um, because it said we're, fa- we're failing because we love the world and we hate death. So, you know, what does that mean? That's something to think about, isn't it? Get me a bit, um, get me a bit of a deep thoughts now, bro. Especially with the sort of stuff you see, like well, at least I sometimes see on the daily. Um, mm. It can be very impactful, um, and it kind of leaves you a bit 
I don't know. It leaves you a bit speechless, really, sometimes because you don't. You see, when you surround yourself with people that aren't really thinking about it or have never discussed it, like I try and talk about it quite often, mm-hmm. but like you know, the people you're surrounded with don't talk about it, or at least they brush it off like it's just nothing, mm-hmm. you know, and it can actually. I don't know, it infuriates you a little bit because it, you know how valuable life is and what opportunity is. In the same way that we value that, like you were talking about, like let's say it's hard off and you value that as a moment, but people mm. don't even value their life like that as a, for a second. Mm. They're just waiting for the next sort of day off or the next sort of, you know, thing to do to entertain themselves or whatever. Um, mm. Now I know everybody gets sucked in the dunya, but to be surrounded by people that never for once talk about anything serious you know yeah. it's really difficult it's like what you you mentioned like at least when someone dies they put the quran on they yeah, imagine yeah. never having that moment yeah, yeah yeah definitely because it's just more it's more things to drown out the the noise you know if somebody dies and they do something else to just yes. to pretend that it didn't happen I mean, or ignore it or... i think in some cultures when someone dies they do a party and they like yeah. drink a lot yeah <laughs> so Oh, may Allah guide us, bro. I mean, yeah, I, you know, this is something that I, I thought of, you know, years ago when I, when thinking about, you know, how Allah is going to punish people, you know, with such a severe punishment for not believing in him. Hmm. And, you know, I'm just trying to kind of make sense of it and think of, I don't know, the scenarios, how that could happen kind of thing. Yeah. That's, sometimes what I imagine is the person who, they have a moment in their life where, I don't know, for example, they were just in a car crash, all right? Yeah. And they understand it could have been severe, but it wasn't severe. At that moment, you have a choice of contemplating a little bit on your life. And if you died at that point, what, what would you know you have done with your life? And these kind yeah. of questions. Or, you know, maybe you had like a, a, a you're going to go to the, to the club with your friends a few hours later and you just went ahead and went to the club anyway and try to kind of brush that aside and that you see that decision that fork in the road where Allah's presented you with the sign yeah and you choose now to continue on with your life as normal is actually a choice you you can't say that it never came to you like it came to you and you made the choice and that is where you can say the blame is on you right yeah that's it bro i'm talking about obviously a non-muslim here but it happens to us as well where we get the reminder we get the ayat we get the signs yeah um and for us it might be something different it might not be to remind to remember that we have a lord who created us and we must worship him it might be Mm. to who knows be better to your parents or whatever it is um it might be an ayah for that and then you're you're at a fork in the road again uh, do you uh, do you delay getting in touch with your mom uh, again, or do you decide, you know, no, I, I'm at least this time, I'm going to reply straight, or I'm going to see yeah. how she is, blah blah. You know, so there's so many forks in the road, yeah, uh, that come from ayat that Allah sends you, and when that fork in the road happen comes, you know, with a fork in the road, you can't go straight. You must yeah, you have to pick turn one. left or right. And that is where Allah can fully say, you you chose this. You chose yeah, it. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, let's end it here, bro. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's end it here, inshallah. Going to get tears in the microphone out here. Tell me about it. That's a good thing the camera's not on. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Well, Jazakallah khairan, Rafa'i, for your question. Uh, and your comment slash question slash suggestion uh very good you know when i was reading i was thinking the reality of death the reward for contemplating it i was thinking come on like we're not shiuch out here we're not going to give some yeah. reminder but it's not just a little dis- discussion you know little conversation alhamdulillah so keep your emails coming uh, as you've heard you know we do go through them and uh, inshallah we'll keep going through them as long as you send them and i guess what we've discovered is uh to make sure you write some will down, even if you can do multiple iterations of it, isn't it as well? So yeah. right now, after listening to this, you could scribble stuff down. You could write it as a note on your phone and just build it over time even. Yeah, I'm know? sure there's good guidance out there for those that seek it, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, if you have any uh, emails or comments or feedback, then go to 
I mean, maybe you could even further educate us on some of the stuff I was saying about um, Wasia and Will and the difference and stuff, because, you know, I'm not the expert on that. Uh, so, yeah, go to mindhousepodcast.com. You can email us. You can send us an anonymous question or comment uh, from there. And, yeah, we'll end it there. Inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu wa na ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu alaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.